Next is vocabulary. Saying it well is proper choice of words. To build my early vocabulary, I used to put three or four words I didn't know on a card, put it up on the sun visor, on my car. Back in those days, I traveled a lot by car. Sure enough, by the end of the day, I'd mastered two or three words. Vocabulary. Some of my friends took a survey among prisoners in New England several years ago. They made a very important discovery, some rehabilitation program they were working on. But here's the discovery they made. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. Isn't that amazing? That vocabulary would affect behavior? Now, if you think about it for a while, it makes sense. Here's why. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. One reason for vocabulary is to interpret what we see, to interpret what we hear. The vocabulary of the mind grapples with the words and the images that come to our mind. Now, if you've got a poor set of words and skills and tools with which to interpret, you can imagine the errors and the mistakes you'll make in judgment. And since vocabulary is a way of seeing, if you can't see well, you can imagine the errors you can make and how they compound as life unfolds. We do two things with vocabulary. We interpret and we express. The words we have are the only words available to us. The words we know are the only tools available to us to, number one, interpret what's going on, to interpret what's being said, and to express your heart and your mind. Now, if you can't interpret well, and if you can't express well, you can imagine what a deterrent that is to the good life and the extra treasures, the extra feelings, awareness, riches, power, influence. So it's very important to have a good vocabulary. So I would ask you, one of the most important books in your library should be the dictionary. Just go through the dictionary. The words are fascinating, their origin and where they came from. Vocabulary. Now here's the last part on saying it well. Don't forget to say it. Practice the art every chance you get. And try to say it well. It's easy to be lazy in language all day and not practice the gift and the art. Then when it comes time to make an important talk, to appeal to a child, we're missing the words and missing the sharpness and missing the vocabulary simply because we lack the practice of doing it every day. If you want to get good at communication, you have to be aware of doing it every day as a practice session of getting better so that when the real important occasions arise, you will have the gift and you'll have the style, you'll have the sharpness and the clarity and the substance and the emotion. I have a key phrase for you. Actions are no substitute for words. Don't fail to say it. Now, we've heard the old expression, words are no substitute for action. That's true. Talk, 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 never act. That's not good. But this also isn't good. Act, 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 and never talk. We must be gifted with words if we want the full treasure of life. So practice every occasion you get. It's okay to send somebody flowers, but don't let flowers do all your talking. Here's why. Flowers have a limited vocabulary. <laughs> About the best flowers can say is, you remembered. That's about the best. Or, you care. That's about all. Flowers don't say, you do incredible things to me. Nobody in this world affects me like you do. Now, see, flowers talk, but they don't say that. That, you got to add in the card. <laughs> right? That, you got to add in person. So the next time you give flowers... Say, just so my flowers won't do all the talking, let me add. And then put the gift of words to work, to go along with the activity. And you will start to sense this whole growing excitement about using language to affect somebody, to translate feelings of heart and mind. And the response you're going to get and the results you're going to get starts growing in measurable quantities. I'm just asking you to take the extra time to engage in these arts and practices. The gift of language. Communications. Affecting people with words. So we've covered step one, have something good to say. Step two, say it well. Here's step three to good communications. Read your audience. It's very important to read and to pick up 
the signals of what's happening with your audience. Now, when I first started lecturing outside my business circles, I had some problems here, reading my audience. I think my early audiences, they all could have left halfway through and I'd have never known it. I was so intent on what I was saying that I was a bit unconscious of what was going on out there. Then I finally learned to look up, to watch and see what's happening. We call this reading what's happening. My largest audience has been 10,000. I wasn't the only speaker. Art Linkletter, Paul Harvey, <laughs> Dr. Peel, Zig Ziglar, myself. We each had an hour, but we had 10,000 people. But now that was the first time I'd ever talked to 10,000 people. Awesome event for me. You know, Paul Harvey, he didn't have any problems. Art Linkletter, he didn't have any problems. But I had some problems that first four or five minutes, right? 10,000 is a lot of people. And you got to read fast, <laughs> right? Because 10,000 people can turn on you quick. But learning to read, what's going on back there? What's happening? Now, it's also just as important to read a person, to read a child. If you want to be effective, you got to get the feedback. You've got to pick up the signals to know whether to be stronger or whether to ease off, whether to change stories, change words, change language. All of this comes by a good ability to read your audience. So let me give you some clues on reading. Number one is simply to listen. Part of reading is listening. You pick up a lot of clues as to what else to say, what all to say by being a good listener. From early times, I think we've learned to be a good speaker. You've got to be a good listener. That's where you pick up the information is to listen well, especially in a private conversation, a more informal conversation. Good listening habits. That's part of reading. Number two, you got to read what you see. There's a good book called How to Read a Person Like a Book. It's a pretty good book by Nuremberg. And it's a study of body language. Now, you can't get too deeply involved in this, or you'll be so intent on reading body language that you may miss the point. But we can all, I think, use some help here and now, some things are very obvious. You're talking to somebody and they've got their arms folded and their chin tucked down and they're frowning. That probably means, right, <laughs> you got your work cut out for you. You got to reach deep into your bag of experiences and language because this one isn't going to be easy. So some body language is fairly obvious. If you're talking to somebody and they're leaning toward the door, that probably means something, right? <laughs> it means you're going to have to get with it. You're not going to have an audience long. So. Part of it is just being conscious, right? Body language, reading what you see. Now, kids are pretty easy to read because they don't even try to fake you out, right? You talk to kids and they're staring out the window. I mean, <laughs> they don't mind showing their total unconcern. But now here's what's more challenging. In a polite society, sometimes body language can be deceiving. If somebody, while you're talking, looks at you and smiles, you got to make sure you don't misread that. 